I'm bonded to you and what you are. That's Nick from Supernatural talking about his on-again, off-again relationship with Lucifer. I don't know who I am if I'm not you. No consequences, no pain, no sorrow. I want that back. I want it back. I don't want to feel now what I didn't feel then. Nick's experienced a lot of pain in his life. Of course, he didn't have to go ahead and become a serial killer, did he? For those of you who've been following the last few episodes of Skeptico, you know I've taken this deep dive into evil. Now, not all listeners have taken that dive with me. There's been a lot of unsubscribing along the way, and I get that. But I still maintain that this evil thing might be one of the best lenses we have for coming to grips with our relationship with this extended consciousness realm. And while I haven't until this point offered my personal working hypothesis on the nature of evil, I might lean on the script writers from Supernatural and use Nick's quote, I don't want to feel now what I didn't feel then. I mean, Maybe that's what this evil thing is about. Escaping feelings, escaping energy that doesn't fit the way we want it to fit. And even if the actions and behaviors that leads us to seem wicked and evil to everyone else, they at least get rid of those feelings for a little while. But what about evil that extends beyond our personal domain? What about today's guest, John Brisson, and his deep and amazingly thorough investigation of the Finders Cult, a group with undeniable links to the CIA, FBI, and high-level intelligence organizations in our government, and a group whose purpose seemed to be the cultivation of the Jeffrey Epstein-esque sexual blackmailing network that could be used for intelligence gathering. What are we to make of this kind of institutionalized evil? I don't know, but maybe the first step is to take a good, long look. Here's a clip from my interview with John. You know, labels are important because they're the way people understand it. And people are going to pigeonhole you as a conspiracy theorist, especially when you come out yourself and call yourself that. And maybe that's a good thing. But I'm just doing my best just to own it because that's what people are going to call me as. Whereas as an investigative journalist, I guess would be a better way of putting it. As far as the finer's case is concerned, I am bringing new documents to the table that were not previously seen, like Ramon J. Martinez's whistleblower complaint. I am interviewing people that have not previously been interviewed before, or at least information had not been released, like, you know, people pertaining to the finder's case, like the prosecuting attorney, Willie Meggs, or, or U.S. Customs, John Sullivan, or um, Ramon J. Martinez's partner, Bob Harold. And so I am moving this case further than the information that was previously given to us by other researchers. So that is true investigative journalism. That is true following the leads and following the information as it goes. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Akaris, and as you know, I'm always impressed by independent researchers who manage to make monumental contributions to our understanding of the world without any institutional support, with barely any financial support, and usually while battling against forces that seek to keep us locked into whatever prevailing narrative they want. I mean, consider today's guest, John Brisson, and what he brings to this ongoing discussion I've been having about the nature of evil. So I'll just remind you, if you've been following along with me on this little journey, you know I've talked to some very legitimate experts on the topic. 
highly respected religious professors like Jeff Kripal, Hugh Urban, top-notch anthropologists like Brian Hayden and Gregory Shushan. These are real legitimate academics who are going to conferences, publishing papers, and are being supported by major institutions, major universities. And you know, I've even kicked these ideas around with the likes of Dean Radin and Rupert Sheldrick. But time and time again, I've been disappointed to find that these folks are, I don't know, they just seem to be unwilling to look at the deep abyss that goes with the data, the compelling data that forces us to confront the reality of some malevolent forces that are in this extended consciousness realm, to put it in kind of skeptical terms. So back today, today's guest, John Brisson, who runs a YouTube channel called We've Read the Documents, which usually features John reading documents, often secret documents that have been released through FOIA requests. But John is also the author of an upcoming book on the Finders Cult, an organization with not just provable links to satanic ritual abuse, but unfortunately provable, and I'm going to emphasize that word again, provable, he's got the documents, links to United States intelligence organizations like the CIA and the FBI who were tapping into this evil in order to compromise foreign diplomats and other individuals they wanted to control through blackmail, through sexual blackmail. And that's going to be a topic we're going to talk a great deal about today. So, you know, uh, John and I were just spending one second talking before this, and this is going to be a rough ride for a lot of people. I know a lot of people have already tuned off. They saw the title or whatever, and they're not going to listen to this. I know in my own personal life, I, I, very few people I can talk to about this. People in my family, I can't talk to about this. They shut down. They just don't. No matter, you can pile the data wide and high. It don't matter, man. They don't want to go there. And that's what I so appreciate about John and his approach, his methodology. He's very, very much into following the data, checking his sources, but he's also willing to go there. John, it's great to have you back on Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me and listening to that long introduction. Thank you very much for having me back on, Alex. I'm very welcome to come back on Skeptico and discuss this you know, issue and its of, of ritual abuse and, and, and government institutions being involved in it and how very actually widespread it is. And we do have documentation. I know there are many, you know, claims that can be made about these different cases, whether it's the Franklin scandal or McMartin preschool or the finders. And some are very hard to substantiate in the claims that have been made in these cases. But I do believe at the bare minimum with a majority of these cases that children were abused at the bare minimum and at the grand maximum it was ritual abuse by the highest levels of governments around the world now john i know where you're coming from when you say stuff like that but i almost think that kind of blurs the message when we start saying the minimum the maximum and all this it's like no what we're talking about here is unimaginable yeah. for most people. And what I think you reveal, and you've been a big part of, you know, I, like I say, I contacted you a couple months and said, hey, I, I, I want to dig into this satanic ritual abuse thing. And I want to know if there's any reality to it. And it's funny for me because I've encountered, you know, I, I did this a couple of years ago. I have up on the screen, like an interview I did with FBI undercover agent, Bob Hammer, who on his last project infiltrated MAMBLA, the Man-Boy Love Association, yeah. which most of, most of us know from the, the craziness that they portrayed it in South Park, but it's a real organization. And yeah, I've told this story before, but now I'll tell it again. You know, I, I remember hearing the passion and the emotional anger 
in this FBI agent's voice when he said he was recounting being in New York in Manhattan and going on again, he's undercover with these pedophiles and he's in New York City at Toys R Us and they're leaning over the rail talking about the violence that they and sex acts, but also connected with violence that they want to perpetrate on these kids that they see playing. These are our kids. You got yeah. kids. I got kids. My kids are a little bit older now, but you know, these are five-year-old kids and the horrible things that these guys want to do. And at the time, you, you know, the reason I, I did that interview was because it was about evil. It was about people who want to deny that evil even exists, you know, and, and here the people are denying that this stuff exists. But here's the point. When I came back to you two months ago, I said, John, I still can't really get my head around this. Is this really happening? Is satanic ritual abuse against children really something that's happening? Because when you Google it, the first freaking hundred entries are about satanic panic. Yes, they are. And then tell folks a little bit about a book that you've referenced called The Witch Hunt narrative. I have it right here in my hand. It was written by um, Rossi Chet, who uh, uh, is a professor at Brown University. And the reason Brown why University, I Ivy League professor. The reason why I wanted to frame it like I do in that is because it's so hard for people to realize how evil and how deep this goes that they'll label it as a witch hunt, which completely negates the victims of all these cases that were abused and made it seem like they were not abused at all. So that's why I usually frame it, you know, he frames it from this too. This book is not conspiratorial at all in the slightest bit. It does not really tackle the ritual sexual abuse side of things of how dark things and how evil things can get. This book is factually based that the children in majority of these cases, whether it's Glendale Monastery School, which is one of the cases that I'm investigating in, I've gotten the Stuart Florida police department records and, and the court uh, records about James Tower and how they label his cases as satanic panic. But it is obvious from when you read, you know, the police report, the court documents that James Tower he, he was, you know, he, he was right in his conviction as well as that was even upheld by psychiatrists later who said that Tower was likely to offend if he was to be released from prison. Now, so, now hold on, hold on. Cause there's like, we're going to dump so much information on people. And I, I, I've picked through, your stuff. And again, I have to alert people because we're just going to tap, we're going to dip into this. Yes. And if they go, go to your channel and they listen to some of the interviews that you've done and you're writing a book on the, the finder's cult, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which plays into this as well. But I kind of wanted to uh, alert people to the kind of interviews that you do, John, because like you did one of, you did an interview with an investigator. Yes. From this Glendale Montessori case. Henry Clements. So this is someone who was boots on the ground, mm -hmm. called in by law enforcement to investigate this Montessori school, and he finds evidence of satanic ritual abuse. So he finds doors that uh, can only be locked from the outside, and the, the lock is like eight feet up so that the kids can't reach it, or six feet up, I should say. He finds chloroform. He finds all this stuff that the investigators kind of suspected but didn't find, and he finds it, and they're relying on him. And he had a kid that went there, and it's like uh, verified. And then when you're referencing back to this book by this Brown University professor, one of, the, one of the cases that everyone's heard about is McMartin Preschool. Even my wife, who's a forensic psychologist, she's bashing me. She goes, yeah, like that fake McMartin Preschool, satanic panic thing. Yeah. And I'm like, I go, go do, anyone can do this. Go to Amazon and look inside, you know, like you can, you don't even have to buy the book. He has it documented there. The yes. physicians, the physicians that, that did medical exams on the McMartin kids and said, there's physical evidence that we normally associate with sexual activity for a three and a half year old. And it's not the parents because the kid yeah. is saying it was my teacher. So this whole satanic panic thing is an orchestrated lie to pull our attention away from what's going on. I mean, you know, look at Oliver Stone's directed uh, movie about McMartin Preschool with James Woods. It's all by design. You know, they, they frame McMartin as 
the most expensive trial that never led to a single conviction, you know, therefore Raymond Bucky is innocent and he, you know, never did anything wrong. And when you read the witch hunt narrative, Rossi Chet, again, it's not going to discuss the actual satanic ritual abuse that I believe that went on at McMartin. It's not going to discuss that per se, but it's going to discuss the actual forensic evidence that children were molested by Raymond Bucky. There's enough medical evidence in here to show that, that Judy Johnson was not some crackpot alcoholic mother who just, you know, started this whole theory to slander the McMartin preschool, that she was driven to alcoholism by people attacking her and slandering her character, which she later, later died from. The evidence in here directly, Judy Johnson's son was sodomized by Raymond Bucky. This is a kid who, if I remember right, is three and a half years old and comes home and can't even verbalize it in sexual terms, but is kind of describing these things that are going on at the school. And the mom totally flips. But like we're saying, the first thing she does is what a parent would do. Take him to yes. the pediatrician. And the pediatrician says, yeah, this kid's been sexually molested. But it was and even more than that. He, she took him to Dr. Scott McGarry, who was like, you know, kind of like a, um, like the, the child's, you know, doctor. And he said, well, yeah, this is really bad because he's, you know, bleeding from the anus. You need to take him to UCLA. So they take him to the Marion Davies Children's Clinic at UCLA. And, you know, both Dr. Linda Gordon and Dr. Jean H. Simpson uh, Savory, who are both, you know, pa pediatricians, you know, Savory, you know, graduated from John Hopkins, had five years of experience in pediatrics. They come to the conclusion that was fairly significant findings of sexual abuse. And even later, a doctor that was hired by the defense came to the same conclusion, too, as well, that Matthew Johnson was severely anally molested. So it's all there. But yet, you know, according to, you know, Nathan and Scheidecker's book about it all being a witch hunt, you know, th it was a young intern that examined Matthew Johnson. No, it wasn't. These are esteemed doctors. I mean, it wasn't just some intern that examined him. You know, and it's not even that they were esteemed doctors. They're just doctors doing their job. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a parent taking a kid in and saying, what's wrong with my kid? And doctors are like, oh, shit. You know, this, I've seen this before. This isn't good. And, and then it leads to a police investigation. The police get in. They say, oh, we've seen this shit before. This isn't good. So, again, pulling back, you know, because you're into documentation and proof. But we always have to pull back to yeah. the controlled narrative. Why is the narrative so strongly, strongly on this crazy idea that this is all panic this is not real when it's so easily or relatively easily if you can get past to your programming the the obviously provable by these documents and that's what i'm going to so let me shift gears for a minute no one the, 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 most of the people listening to this show unless they followed your work which is fantastic know anything about the finder's cult and this is going to blow people away, but it's also going to catapult us right in the middle of events that are unfolding today in terms of a term that you use called the pedocracy. But tell us, back up, take a big breath, tell us how you even got interested in looking at the finder's cult. Because, let me pause again, because I wanted to mention this. You know, John, you've been on Skeptica before for Fix Your Gut, which is a book that you wrote. And that's how I originally found you, because I had had medical problems that led me to you. I found your research, which you did kind of driven by a personal tragedy that you had to experience in your family with kind of mainstream medicine that led you to look for some kind of alternative routes totally on top of the information. I found your research to be incredibly useful, supported by the real research that's out there. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed you coming on. People can find that. I even referred you to my daughter and you kind of helped her. So I know the kind of work you've done and people might know you from the Fix Your Gut book that you wrote and the, the work and interviews that you've done on that. Can you tell us how that even led or, or what was behind this new kind of investigation you've been doing into this 
evil that is these crimes against children. It's actually not new. I just had come out with uh, doing the YouTube channel um, and doing interviews out in the public about my knowledge of conspiracies. YouTube channel started about eight months ago of me actually being public and me actually doing something with the knowledge that I had. But I, my father was a conspiracy theorist. I grew up, uh, you know, just, you know, I was at, I was a neoconservative at the time. I had my grandfather's political beliefs. And I thought my father was a little bit uh, crazy in a lot of things that he believed in. God, I wish I could tell him now if he was still living of how right he was about the world. But so I, I mean, I, I knew, you know, JFK assassination was, was a government plot, and, and, but I still, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I didn't believe, you know, what my father was telling me or not to trust what happened at 9-11 and stuff like that and everything. So I'd always had that basis. And uh, I listened to Alex Jones about 2008. Um, one night I was listening to Coast to Coast AM very late, and he started breaking down of how 9-11 was an inside job. And so from there, I started, you know, looking and researching conspiracies. And around that time, too, Alex Jones had Joe Wallach on, you know, who um, talks a lot about natural health. And so that got me into natural health. So it was around the same time that I started doing both um, or researching both. And I've been a researcher for both ever since. Now, as far as, you know, fix your gut. Yeah, I started, you know, actually making, you know, a business and helping people and coaching and writing books and stuff like that. Long before I've done anything with conspiracy, just because I felt compelled to do so my own self being ill, me, you know, losing both my parents when I was young to illness and, you know, losing a son, trying to help him with the condition that he had, you know, and everything. And so I was, you know, very compelled to do that. But then eventually I was like, well, I might as well release the conspiracy research I'm doing too as well. <laughs> so I just started coming out with that. I mean, some of my first interviews some, yeah, they were fix your gut related, but some of them were also conspiracy going back to 2016. So it's always been both. It's just now that I'm actually putting my research out there is really the only difference. What I see in your research is, again, an independent researcher who's just following the data and trying yes. to get the bottom of things. And I hate when we, you know, labels are important because they're the way people understand it. And people are going to pigeonhole you as a conspiracy theorist, especially when you come out yourself and call yourself that. And maybe that's a good thing. But I'm just doing my best just to own it because that's what people are going to call me as. Whereas as an investigative journalist, I guess would be a better way of putting it. As far as the finer's case is concerned, I am bringing new documents to the table that were not previously seen, like Ramon J. Martinez's whistleblower complaint. I am interviewing people that have not previously been interviewed before, or at least information had not been released, like, you know, people pertaining to the finder's case, like the prosecuting attorney, Willie Meggs, or, or U.S. Customs, John Sullivan, or um, Ramon J. Martinez's partner, Bob Harold. And so I am moving this case further than the information that was previously given to us by other researchers. So that is true investigative journalism. That is true following the leads and following the information as it goes. Now, you've just kind of done a brain dump on people there that's going to force them to jump right in the middle of this. So let's go back and talk about, like, for someone who's totally uninitiated, do government intelligence organizations like the CIA, Mossad, FBI, do they ever use blackmail? And can we prove that? Yes, we can prove that. There's many cases that involve the idea of brownstone operations or sexual blackmail. So we have the Franklin scandal, which has implicated at the highest levels of government of them being blackmailed, George H.W. Bush, Ronald Wilson Reagan, Bill Casey, of, of them being around the nexus of Lawrence E. King that's been reported both in John DeCamp, former Nebraska state senator's book, The Franklin Scandal, Nick Bryant's The Franklin Cover-Up, him being an investigative reporter, and Henry Vincent, Confessions of a D.C. Madam, who was around the nexus of Lawrence E. King and Craig Spence. So in that case, it, it's very well documented for those who look into it. Jeffrey Epstein, was just, they've been using this template forever. Why? Why would our CIA, why would our FBI, 
why would they blackmail people? That's not in the Constitution. They're not supposed to do that. Why would they blackmail people, let alone sexual blackmail? CIA is not supposed to operate in American soil, but they still do. When people look into it, if they're halfway open to just understanding how power works, blackmail is your go-to tool in any respect. Because if you pay somebody to do something, then the, your, your only go as far as that money goes. And if somebody pays them more or if they have enough money, they don't have to do it anymore. Blackmail, exactly. particularly sexual blackmail of this kind, is just a much more effective tool. It's almost, it's almost an irresistible tool. to Because when we're going to talk about the finders and, and what they did and the extent to which they got involved with this horrible evil, people are going to recoil and go, no, we wouldn't have done that. And it's like the temptation is super great here to do sexual blackmail, right? I mean, obviously, I mean, with the sexual black belt comes power. You can get people to vote from wh whatever uh, you want them to. You can use it as a form of initiation that they are willing to do so, that they are willing to do other things. Um, I mean, there's many different reasons why this black belt would take place by these intelligence agencies, by the highest levels of government, by the world order. It's also a good tool, like I mentioned earlier, to weed out, okay, so this person is willing to do this, for example, let's say it's as simple as having an affair with another, you know, if they're married, have an affair. Well, then are they also willing to be, you know, have sex with underage children? It's to test how far someone can go and what you can, you know, hold against them and use against them. It's all of that. It's like a nexus of total control over someone where it's not constantly having to buy someone off. Once you have the blackmail once, you can threaten to use it forever. So you kind of mixed a couple of different ideas there and, and we can't pull all this apart because you're not a law enforcement professional and we can't know for sure what's going on. Tell us what you do know. So back up for a minute. What is the finder's cult? How did you first come across it? And then how does it tie into intelligence organization involvement? The Finders Cult is a cult that was headed by Marion D. Petty, um, who has many, many connections <laughs> to intelligence organizations. He ran uh, apartment buildings for OSS members, Office of Strategic Services, during World War II, where he would give them, you know, rooms. Some people say to gain intelligence. Some people say it was the, the beginning of a brownstone operation. Brownstone um, operation. What's a brownstone operation? Pretty much blackmail. Uh, Detective Jim Rothstein has to, uh, talked about and links about brownstone operations. Brownstone operations is a way that you bring someone to a certain area where, it, you know, there's filming equipment or you can get some sort of evidence or documentated evidence, a camera, something. So you bring of, them into a room. There's hidden cameras, hidden microphones. They don't know that. They're being recorded they're doing some act that they don't want to get out. You, you, a few years ago, it used to be homosexuality. Now nobody cares about that. Or it used to be infidelity. Yes. No one cares about that. So it, it ups the ante, but people still do care about that. Whatever you can get them to do, <clears throat> whatever their weakness is, whether it's just doing cocaine, you know, or smoking weed or something like that, anything that could compromise them, you're going to record it and then you're going to start in on this blackmail thing. That's a brownstone operation, right? Yes, yes. Even back then, you know, taking pictures of you entering the hostel with a prostitute, for example. Um, so yeah, I mean, any any evidence that they can give where it's, a, it's to set up to blackmail you, that is a brownstone operation. For example, there have been instances of Craig B. Spence throwing parties at his house where his party was wired, his house was wired up with two-way mirrors and recording devices and famous people would go to his parties and there would be, you know, children provided there by Lawrence E. King for them to sexual blackmail and even practice ritual satanic abuse at those parties. The same could be said about and, Jeffrey Epstein. And Epstein's hold on, because that's going to that's gonna throw people. And, and what, what we understand now is that kind of what you alluded to before, it, it kind of becomes somewhat of a slippery evil slope in that, you know, if you caught me doing cocaine with a prostitute, and then I'm in your club and you're inviting me to your party, I may not 
approve of people molesting five-year-old and four-year-old kids, but I'm at the party with other people, you know, strange bedfellows kind of thing who are. I may not be into satanic ritual abuse, but I am now at a party where there's other people who yes. are trying to tap into these malevolent forces, and we'll talk about that for a reason, and that's their thing. So it's almost like this kind of uh, crazy brownstone blackmail thing creates this kind of cesspool that doesn't necessarily have to have a, 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 a full on, you know, purpose for joining all these different people together. They just kind of congregate by the force of the brownstone blackmail operation. Yes, and of course, everybody who's gone to this, these parties may have not participated in, you know, the darkest uh, things that occur, like ritual satanic abuse or, 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 or child abuse at these parties. Some of it can be compartmentalized. I agree with you on that. Um, now, now, to separate that, separate the weed from the chaff, as they say, that can be very difficult. Um, you usually have to look at someone's position within the world order, how much power they have. You know, I seriously doubt you know, Bill Clinton didn't do anything wrong on the Lolita Express, for example, and, and or, you know, Donald Trump, you know, hanging around with Epstein too as well, going to his house frequently and everything like that. And, you know, or riding Alan on Dershowitz him. just because he's an attorney and he's, yeah, he's I mean, listed. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And, and I think this is like another important point. And the point I would make is burden of proof. At what point does the burden of proof shift to these people need to prove to us that they weren't involved. If you were in the Franklin scandal party with King and we know that he was trafficking children, sexually abusing children, doing child pornography and all these other crazy stuff, then the burden of proof, I think, shifts, shifts to you. You were at the party. You sh should have known or probably knew that these things were going on, proved to us that it's not true. And in the news recently, we have Prince Andrew. He cannot yeah. prove that. So no. he, looks, he looks really bad because he can't establish. We, we all accept this idea of burden, burden of proof, and the burden of proof has now shifted. So I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was, I was going to say, I mean, you're 100% right. Of course, with Prince Andrew, he claims the picture that he took with uh, Virginia roberts Caffrey was an, a, a doctored picture, when obviously that is her and him with, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell standing behind them. You know, it's obviously not a Photoshop picture, uh, but that's what he's claiming, you know. So he can't, just like Lawrence E. King, and, and, and other people ask, well, if, 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 these, if this is true, then why aren't these cases prosecuted to the full extent of the law? Why aren't these people in jail? Well, I mean, if you believe in a world order type structure, or however you want to put it, that you know, the government's going to protect its own self-interest when they're running these operations, that's not going to happen. Lawrence E. King did not go to jail for you know, running a massive sexual black bell ring and molesting children and everything like that. He went to jail for embezzlement of embezzling funds from the uh, Franklin Community Credit Union. Worse yet, his co-conspirators in Lincoln, Nebraska, and we have to keep backing up, and I don't know how this is going to work, or, you know, again, people are just going to tune out, or they've already heard all this stuff, and they think we're not going to cover anything new, and we are going to cover something new. But the Franklin scandal is kind of well documented, but what yes. I was going to point out, the real tragedy, I think, that people find in this is that when it came to prosecutions, they actually prosecuted the victims Yes, got him convicted for perjury, which when we look at it through the lens of now knowing that clearly those people were guilty, clearly. I mean, when they first raided King, who was set up to run this phony baloney uh, savings and loan and was running it, and was running it into the ground and was embezzling all this money, but they go grab his computer and they find all sorts of child porn on the computer. So again, it's physical evidence that this stuff is going on. And he's taking the kids and the kids say, yeah, they took me to Bohemian Grove yeah. and I was sold out and all this stuff. But then these kids, <laughs> these kids are actually prosecuted for, because they they're they're now testifying against some very, very powerful people in the Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, connected elite, and they get the whole thing reversed and get these guys convicted of perjury, which is just an absurd 
you know, injustice. And the other thing I want to mention, you keep throwing world order, and you've kind of said that a couple times. I don't want to say that. I don't want to go there, because that's a whole other discussion. I think we, we can, if we ever do get back to the finder's cult, which we keep trying to get back to, <laughs> there's, there's many different ways to understand it. And one clear way of understanding it is that what we talked about in terms of brownstoning, a brownstone operation and, and blackmail, and that this would be an, just an irresistible tool for intelligence organizations to use. They can say, well, we could send a dozen agents out in the field and we could try and you know, get on the inside and penetrate this group, or we could just film this one guy doing these horrible deeds to an eight-year-old girl and then he'll give us the whole thing. So yeah. which should we do? A three-year undercover operation that's gonna cost all this money and may expose us to all this blowback or do we just do this one little trick over here? But in, in, in doing that trick, we have to partner with the most evil people in the world who, you know, groom and traffic little kids for sex. And some intelligence guy says, yeah, but you know, really, when you look at it from a cost benefit analysis, maybe we should do that. I mean, that's what the finder's cult is about. Or, or maybe we should run guns or run drugs with the Rand Contra. Rand Contra involves all three of them: gun running, uh, child pornography, and running through the Franklin scandal, um, and 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 drug running, gun running. So it involves all of that. So all the, I, mean, I guess I could say is, yeah, we're taking a long time to get to the finders, but however, it's important because we have to lay the groundwork that this isn't just one specific instance that this occurred. It's occurred in multiple, multiple instances. I know Epstein is you know, on everybody's minds now, because that's the most recent one. But there, I mean, there, the, the, the Palermo affair in, in the 1960s, and, and, and then, you know, Franklin and McMartin, and, and, and I mean, it, it, it's not just one isolated event, and they're using all of this, and, and, and in my guess is prosecutions never happen, or at least to the degree that they should have, even in the daycare scandals, is to limit it all Say, I mean, they're still they're limiting witch hunt. They're saying witch hunts today when it comes to Trump and and and, and him being innocent and having not to do anything. And you'll see the vernac. And, and, and it's interesting because you'll have people like Michael Savage, who compare the the Russian Russian witch hunt to Trump to McMartin and say, well, McMartin's a witch hunt. And so, you know, the, the very, you know, this is, you know, the Russian scandals are witch hunt. So you'll see that a lot of it still being used in vernacular today and still being pushed by people that you think should be intelligent. I mean, Michael Savage wrote a book on famous witch hunts. And in his book for McMartin, he does not, you know, read this, take the time or do anything. He lists as his source a list verse article on McMartin. I mean, it's, it's, they, does, they made this by design, in my opinion, so that they could continue to get on with their brownstone operations because no one thinks twice about sending their children to daycares anymore. No one thinks twice because if you think about it, ah, oh, it's just it's just satanic panic. What are you doing? Why are you concerned about sending your kid off? And I'm pretty sure abuses are still occurring. We just don't hear about them anymore because reporters aren't going to report it because of what happened with all the day, daycare scandals in the 1980s and 1990s. So, so let's take one more stab at going back to finders because okay. we've kind of talked around about it and, and I kind of sent us maybe in a different direction. So the finders cult, what, what is it? Why is it a cult per se? And then what is the connection to what we're talking about, these brownstoning operations? It's a cult because Marion Petty was the leader of a group of people that would enter and exit out of the finders. And when they entered to the finders, they would give up their monetary possessions. They would give up their real estate, which you would normally see with cults of how the leader would get everything. And they put everything into what was called an invisible bank where they, you know, Petty would say, well, if you left, you'd get your stuff back. Well, fighters members would later sue that would leave the cult that would not get, you know, what they put back into the visible bank back. 
Um, now, I'd actually argue a cult, and I've kind of changed it in the book I'm, I'm, I'm writing. I, I have references as a cult to make it more palatable to people, but I do actually think it's more, should be more classified as the finder's operation, because that seems like what it is with, you know, Marion Petty's ties initially to the Office of Strategic Services, him being part of the Air Force, and, and later with the information that we have from the investigative leaves memo, uh, being trained in, in espionage at the Jesuit College, Georgetown University. Take us through a timeline. With Petty. Petty joined uh, the Air Force, and he was a chauffeur to many famous people at the time. He chauffeured Harry S. Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Hap. Hap Arnold, who was head of the Air Force, was, was one of the heads of the Air Force at the time. So he chauffeured many, many high up elite people around the time of World War II and afterwards. And he was also owning um, these apartment buildings in Washington, D.C. that he was renting to Office of Strategic Services members. So he's had connections to the government, the highest levels of government, even back then. Now, he claims that he got the money to start the finders and to buy property in Virginia by winning poker games over time and just saved up his money to buy land, where the investigated leads memo that was leaked, and we still don't know who the author of that is, has made references to that it was him knowing people within intelligence was how he got that money because he had okay. high level connections. It wasn't that he was to buy all these hundreds of acres of land. It wasn't from him winning poker games while he was in the military. Right. And, and that would be consistent with kind of what we're seeing with the latest breaking kind of inside story of the Epstein thing. And maybe you want to talk about that is for most people that even begin to understand Epstein, they weren't even awake to any of it until the phony hanging. And then even just the average citizen goes, come on, that's just ridiculous. The suicide thing, it doesn't fit. Well, the kind of next level research that people are doing says, really, if you look at it, Epstein looks a lot more like a front man fall guy thing. Yes, yes. And one of the telltale signs of that is the stuff is in his name. No one puts their name on stuff when they're doing those kind of deeds. And I think the same is true in what you're talking about. Whenever we see somebody, I own the land, I own the apartments, and I'm doing, I'm part of this brownstone operation, then it's like, well, you're probably just a front man because no one who's really doing that stuff would be having their name on the line. What do you think about that? And, and maybe fill people in on the Epstein thing that I might be leaving out. No, I mean, I 100% agree with you. If, according to Epstein, I think he was lower on the rung when it comes to, it's like Lawrence E. King. I think, you know, that there were people, Craig B. Spence was higher than Lawrence E. King. Uh, there were people higher up within these organizations and Lawrence E. King was the fall man. Jeffrey Epstein was the fall man. So a Jeffrey Epstein. Guilty though. Came, guilty fall man. Oh, of not, course. Oh, yeah. of course. I'm not, I'm just, I'm not, no, I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying those people go down, the higher up people keep their hands clean. And, and so because of that, you know, I would say people that are higher up than Jeffrey Epstein would be Ghislaine Maxwell, Les, Lex Wexner, the billionaire that, who gave Jeffrey Epstein his New York City mansion for $1, and supposedly that mansion was wired up for the Brownstone operation that like was occurring. Like 3 or $4 million worth of audio video Property. record. And, and audio, just, no, what I heard is 3 or $4 million yeah. of audio video recording equipment in a secret room underneath a stairway to kind of manage and control it and upload it and all the rest of that. So again, finders, mm -hmm. finders cult. The, the same parallels, right? This guy is setting up these apartments, if you will, and we don't have the full story like we do on Epstein yet. No, but probably the same, probably the same operation. I think you're right. Is instead of calling it a cult, it's an operation from the very beginning because it's good business to run these these rings of uh, blackmail. Yeah. So I mean. Marion Petty buys all that land from Charles Marsh, and I believe that he wasn't just from, from getting playing poker. It was because his connections gave him the money to be able to set up this free state. Because that was Marion Petty's main, one of his main operations separate from 
you know, the filming of child pornography or, or separate from the darkness was that he co-opted a lot of the human potential movement. Um, and it seemed like that he was the CIA's man to do so and to kind of control it and to steer it from what I've seen. I mean, he also had connection, two connections that we know of to Timothy Leary and that he was dealing with a Walt a Scheidecker who was Timothy Leary and Billy Hitchcock. So time and time again, you see that it, Petty can't just be lucky to have all these connections to all of these famous people and for him to be no one. He couldn't chauffeur around Dwight D. Eisenhower, Patton, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Charles Edward Marsh, and he, he couldn't know all these people throughout his whole life and just be like you and I. It's just the odds of that are just very small. Okay, so yeah, I'm, there's a lot of kind of cult elements there that ring bells with other cults we've seen. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm worried that we're not stitching together the story in a way that people are going to be able to follow it. Okay. So we have Petty. He's chauffeuring around all these super high level presidents and the highest level in the military. And as we know, chauffeur doesn't just mean you're a good driver. It also means you're a confidant because you yes. see things yes. that other people aren't supposed to see and you're trusted to keep secrets that others might not. And these keep. people are talking to him too. He, right. You know, that's mentioned too, you know, in interviews that they are, they're having discussions with him, telling him private information too as well. Heads of state selling him private information. So let's skip ahead in the story to where this finders group and Petty first encounter law enforcement. And I like the Tallahassee police encounter because it seems like a pretty clean, clean slate investigation of uh, when these people are, are run into law enforcement. Or maybe there's something before that. Yes, the only thing that we have about the previous raids is a little bit of the documents that were released in the FBI vault from the Metropolitan Police Department investigation that was once labeled secret, but it's not anymore because time has passed on it. On but it, on but big labeling. picture, there's a raid. What do they find in this warehouse? Okay, but let me go to the Metropolitan Police Department to set, to set everything up for that raid, okay? So in that raid, they were, they were you know, telling – so it starts the whole pornography uh, investigation and in that they were raiding the Finders warehouse and interviewing members of the Finders that they were shooting pornography at the warehouse. Why did they suspect that? Why would the police go and just randomly uh, raid some warehouse? Because we were, because according to the, all we have is Toby Terrell's instance in his book, The Game Caller. The only thing I could piece together from that was, was they were having women that were entering the warehouse that were, I mean, it's like a warehouse, like, you know, surrounded by other warehouses. They were having beautiful women entering the warehouse. So they thought pornography was being shot there. And when they went there and raided the place, they found the camera and the staging area that would later be implicated by Ramon J. Martinez, that they were shooting pornography there as well too, child pornography. Right. So that makes sense. They're just some local Washington DC cop. They're doing their investigation, either in prostitution or whatever. And they go, Hey, this looks strange. And they follow their suspicion and they raid the place. Now yes. take us to the Martinez thing, because who is he and what is he tasked to do and how does he tie into this? Well, I guess maybe I should start with Tallahassee as far as doing the timeline. So later in 1987, which first started this whole modern idea of what we know about the Finders case, Alex, is that two, two men were arrested, Douglas Edward Ammerman and James Michael Hollowell. They were arrested on February 4th, 1987, when a concerned citizen called in and, and said they noticed many uh, disheveled, dirty children that were behaving like wild animals in Myers Park in Tallahassee, Florida. And so the cops get there, two cops, Tony Mashburn and Judy Shioki. They both, you know, arrive at the scene. They witness the children. They witness, you know, the two adults. This, they witness the van that was there, the, the, the blue sportsman van that the children and the adults were living out of. And, and, and they, what, are, what do the adults look like? They're wearing suits. So the kids are disheveled and dirty. 
and the adults are wearing suits in Tallahassee, Florida. So they start noticing something's off. So they start interviewing Hollowell and Ammerman. So, you know, the men mentioned that they were taking the kids to a special school in Mexico. Did not identify that they had any relation to the kids whatsoever. Police officers are automatically suspicious. Like, what, what is this? I mean, anybody would, <laughs> you know. So they moved to arrest Ammerman and Hollowell and take the children into custody. And when they do, Hollowell refuses to talk and he faints and planks on the ground. And there's actually video and Derek Rose is trying to, he's another investigator trying to hunt down this video of them, you know, lifting Hollowell as he's planked on the ground and putting him into the cop car. And that was filmed and that used to be, you know, broadcast everywhere during the fighters case. But Hollowell also had two forms of Miranda rights with him when he was arrested. One stating that he had something to hide and another stating that he had nothing to hide. So why all of this, you know? It, okay, so it's, these, it's, guys, these guys are arrested. Well, Tallahassee police, they're on this. They're like, this is bizarre. So what happens next? They were both, a child with, they were both charged with child abuse and they were given $100,000 bonds each. And so from there, the, the, the Tallahassee Police Department starts their investigation. They start looking at the contents in the van. In the contents of the van, you get a TRS-80 computer, which was very sophisticated at the time that the finders were using to connect to telephone lines to communicate back to D.C. to like BBS message boards and messages that, they, that they, they privately had at that time that they were using in communication. They also found a Chinese-English dictionary, which will get to, you know, the finders had many connections supposedly to China and possibly through telexes that there were selling of children to China that the finders were facilitating, supposedly, that Ramon J. Martinez had found uh, during his investigation of both the apartment building and the warehouse later in Washington. And they also found pictures within the van, and some of those pictures were of naked children. Now, the finders would argue that those pictures were just adults taking pictures of their kids. Da, 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 da. Let's, not, let's not muddy the water with bullshit, completely flat earth bullshit kind of explanations. They found child pornography. They're cops. They see it. They're on this case now, right? I mean, they are on this thing, right? So they're, try, they're trying to track down the parents of the kids is what the Tallahassee Police Department is trying to do. So when they take the kids into the police station, they start noticing that the children don't understand like modern objects, like clocks, typewriters. They start you know, a few of them start urinating on the floor. And so they have very off behavior. And they talk about giving, getting food as a reward and that they, they follow a very, very strictly vegan diet. And, and so they start, you know, interviewing the children. Jordan Arico, who was labeled as Mary, at the time, she, every time they ask her about uh, sexual abuse, she becomes very fidgety and doesn't really want to answer those questions. How old are the children? They range anywhere between six to three. And how many of them are there? Six. Okay. So there the very interesting thing about this is is when i when i interviewed former tallahassee police department officer rick huffman so i had always thought that through the fbi that they would you know the mothers would have came down they would have checked the birth certificates or shown some proof other than the children actually you know responding to the parents like this is my mother this is my father or, you know, but, but there's the mothers that went down, but you understand what I'm saying. So I thought there would have been more proof of trying to back that up. From what I'm ascertaining, what I'm finding out, that was not, I, I, I need to find okay. out. Okay, but John, b back up for a minute here, because, okay, so these are cops. They're just doing what, at this point, they're, they know there's something on. They just want to find the case. So what do they do next? How do they contact these kids who are like just feral animals uh, how do they contact their parents? What do they do? Who are their parents? They're trying to track down leads. They're getting many calls uh, from family members of the finders. Like they got a call from... Um, yeah, but, but I mean, do they, do they call in the media and say, hey, here are these kids? Yes, they call, they call in the media. 
they're saying, you know, here are these kids. It's, it's very well reported, even throughout the Associated Press. It's reported throughout the United States. They're trying to find the identities of these children, of who their parents are, if they were parents of members within the cult. Um, well, they don't know there's a cult at this point, right? I mean, they have some idea around that time, yes. Right, but I mean, they're just, the, 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 before we can say cult, I mean, they just say, who are the parents of these kids? Because number yes. one, we want to reunite the kids with their parents, but number two, we want to investigate what's going on. So how do they then connect these kids with, quote unquote, their parents? Well, eventually the parents, after a week, step up and contact the Tallahassee Police Department that they want to come from Tallahassee, that they were in California, and they waited because everybody was blowing it out of proportion, that, you know, this was satanic ritual abuse, and they were satanic elements, and they were a fear for their life. So they waited a week to go down to Tallahassee to meet with the Tallahassee Police Department for them to, you know, try to get custody of their children. How many parents are there? 12. They're all within the finders. Okay. So there's 12 parents. When you say they're all in the finders, we'll later find out that they're associated with the finders operation or finders cult. But at yes. this point, they're just adults who are living in California. What else do we know? Well, the, the about- girl, well, they weren't living in California. The women were there for working. They called it weaning the children away from their mothers. So they were there at working in California, but their bases were still in the apartments in, in Washington, D.C. area, and we're still in the warehouse. But yes, during the investigation, the Tallahassee Police Department figures out that these were their parents, these were members of the finders, that they were a cult, that's what they were labeled as such. Now, some people have disagreements in there. When I talked to Rick, Huff, Rick Huffman, and just like you know, he mentioned in the, the paper and everything like that, there's two ways of framing the finders that happen like it happens with all this. Oh, they're just progressive. The progressive with how they raised the children, how the children were pretty much wild, and and previously beforehand that we learned that there, you know, two children had left the warehouse area and had been picked up by the police and and, and had stayed a certain amount of time in foster care before this event had even happened. So they kind of look at them and well, they're just progressives and that's how they raise their kids and there's and that's okay. And anybody who tried to fight for the kids, like uh, prosecuting attorney Willie Meggs, they just labeled him as a Christian as a nut. He's just a nut. He's just a zealot with a, with a, with a, sh- a chip on his shoulders, you know, trying to keep the children away from their parents and the finders and everything like that. They, they label him as such. Again, it's the whole witch hunt narrative. They label, you know, the people who are trying to get down to the bottom of things and trying to protect the children as Christians and having Christian proclivities. And the people that say the finders didn't do anything, they were more progressive. Well, th- there's, you know, We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, there's a lot of deep waters there that we have to kind of tread as well. I, I'm trying to put it together, I guess, in, in maybe a different way, which is, you know, you got to tell the story. So we're just two guys having a conversation here. I'm not changing the world or anything like that. I'm trying to understand this. I do think the false narratives and repeating the false narratives and the obviously false narratives I don't think that helps the story. I don't think any reasonable person would see this as fitting into anything close to uh, progressive child rearing, especially when now our eyes have been more open to the grooming of children and the involvement of children in sex crimes. And it fits so exactly into that model that I just don't think we need to spend a lot of time with those alternative narratives, even if they did entertain people back in 1987. Who cares? As we look back on it, it's clearly these kids were being... But not everybody's looking at it that way, though. They're labeling it such. That's why I'm bringing that to the table that... No, I I mean, no, it's it's, it's flat earth stuff. It's, It's flat earth stuff. You know, and when I say flat earth stuff, it's like it just... We, we've seen this over and over again in all these different fields, you know, as even in the, the more mundane stuff that I've done, and you know my show, you know, on near-death experience, you can sit and argue and debate with people, and I still sometimes engage in it, on these crazy, you know, last gasp of a dying brain, or, you know, some stuff that just doesn't add up, and, you know, you have uh, mountains and mountains of scientific papers that refute that over and over again, and, and this is a tactic, you know, we have to. But see- the thing is, is with this, we don't have. I mean, we don't. 
there's so much pushback on it that you have to show why the other side is wrong. Just like when we talk about the execution of Henrietta and Igor that the children have participated in and how I believe that to be a satanic ritual, the, the finders and everything that was reported about it at the time, uh, you know, I mean, later on, at first they, they, they presented it as such as being a satanic ritual that these children participated in, but later it was changed. It was now looked upon in, because you got to remember, you, the way you and I look at things are more with our eyes open is different than the general public. So when, you know, when most of the general public look at it, they're going to go with the idea that's being pushed to them that it was just animal husbandry, because that's what the finders are trying to, in the media later on, try to say it was, that the experience was just them teaching, you know, if you were a butcher and you're raising your kids in the art of butchery, then you would show them how to butcher a goat, and you would give a three-year-old child the goat's head to hold on a civil platter in a picture, and, you know, rip out the womb, and, and you know, you know pull the fetuses out and, and you know that that they label that as such so you have to show why that is ludicrous and then okay. the fact that the, that it, that's what i'm trying to do see this is a this is an interesting discussion and it's one that we should have because only people like you and i can have this kind of discussion this level three discussion see i i don't think you do i don't think you can get there from here so what you're describing is again this, and you kind of hinted at it, maybe people can pick up the thread of that story, is there is this ritualistic slaughter of this goat that clearly for anyone who's looked into it is occulted, satanic, you know, with all the symbolism and stuff like that. And their explanation of it was, as you said, just this absurd idea of animal husbandry and why you would show a three-year-old and have them have a photo with the goat's head on the thing, you know, but my point is can't get there from here. But some I people do, but been... some people do wake up though. I woke up. It does happen. And we can't sensationalize things either. Like, you know, uh, the QAnon people saying that there's, you know, huge adrenochrome farms where, you know, you, 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 we're trying to objectively follow the facts of where they lead to. You know, and so that's why I'm trying to present that, you know, it's, it's, just, it's to, to present their argument as false. I have to show why it is false. And some people will read this who previously did not believe in ritual satanic abuse or did not believe that the government is involved in such things. Some people will come to the conclusion that it is a real thing. That's why it's important. I mean, I even saw it with Henry Clements when I asked him claims that were written about him in books of statements that he made. And he said, I never made that statement. And him, you know, and me interviewing him multiple, multiple times and us having conversations throughout many months and him never changing his story and him never adding things or embellishing things or anything like that. You, as an author, I have to, you know, show what the evidence shows and not take things out of context, not put words in people's mouths. So I ha you know, I think it's important for me to do these things because there will be some people who will, not everyone, you're right. You can't, you can't get everyone to look at it. Some people don't want to stare into the abyss and realize how evil this is. Want to see that it goes to the top levels of government. They want to live with their head buried in the sand because they can't just face that cruel, harsh, true reality of life in the world that we live in. But still, for some that still hold on to that objectivity, you have to show them of why these narratives are wrong. Because if 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 we go with every if if I just start out with, you know everything that deals with satanic ritual abuse in all of these cases. If I just start out with that, it's going to immediately turn a whole bunch of people off that will not recognize the true deaths of this. And there are people that do change their minds. You changed your mind, did you not, when you started looking into the evidence? Yeah, I mean, it, but I was already predisposed to, I mean, I think you go through these layers. It's like layers of an onion, you know. I have a good personal friend who did not believe it, who worked for CPS until he read the Franklin scandal and knew the reports that were given by the CPS officials in the Franklin scandal, that that was what changed him. He went from not believing it to believing it afterwards and doing research on his own. It happens. I agree with you. And I think you make an excellent point. And I, I love how you just laid all that out. Again, in this kind of inside baseball discussion, which is interesting, so I'm going to pursue it a little bit further. The flip side of that, that I was 
trying to tap into is that the bunny trail stuff can get really frustrating too, you know? So yeah. spending an in an inordinate amount of time on the just the, the ludicrous Eeyore story, to me, I just have been down that path a million times. It's flat earth kind of stuff. It's like, obviously that's a manufactured story. I'm glad that you got the story out there. I just don't, you know, it's like the false equivalency argument the skeptical argument. Like there has to be a balance. We have to give equal time to these other things. And you're not saying that. I'm, I'm not just, giving I them guess, equal time. I'm saying this is what they say. This is why it's wrong. Uh, that, fine. So, so I'm just super sensitive to that. And because and, and, I want to get to not one narrative, like this is the answer kind of narrative, but I want to kind of string this stuff together in a way that's going to get us more quickly to understanding this stuff from the big picture standpoint. So the fact that there's this, so here's where we're at. I mean, back to our story, we got this finders operation that is also a yeah. cult. So it's pushing all the buttons that we know to be the cult buttons and getting people mind controlled and getting them to give up their, common sense and their their morals their sense of self their sense of self all this stuff in exchange for these other things and in this case it's mixed in with this sexual abuse of children and all the rest of that but so back to the to the story i, I want to follow the chronology if we can so we can imagine at this point that the tallahassee police they may be acting like hey we're just trying to you know reunite these kids but you gotta believe that deep down and again folks john brisson has talked to got picked up the phone picked up the skype and talked to people from the tallahassee police department that remember this case this is a real researcher investigator who has unique information to bring to this. It's just it's kind of remarkable. You know, back to the beginning. I, I, I gotta go back to the very beginning intro. Who the hell's doing this? You know, I talked to all these, like I said, all these academics I talked to that want to dismiss this or not want find find a reason not to believe it. Please call up the Tallahassee police, like John did. Please call up the Tallahassee police investigators who worked on the case. Talk to them. So back to the Tallahassee police. I know a little bit about how police investigations work. These guys know these people are guilty and they want the parents to come in because they want to get their testimony. Well, they want to... some of them do, sure. but some sure. of them don't. Good um, point. Good point. So, and then, so they bring in, okay, so they, they, they take the children to be examined by a doctor to see if any, if any sexual molestation had uh, taken place. And I'm still trying I'm still trying to track down those reports or trying to track down anybody that can verify outside the Tallahassee Police Department documents on those. And so they bring in Dr. Diamond Greenberg. Well, Dr. Diamond Greenberg was for the defense of the McMartin trial, and he was one of the lead you know, experts for the defense to cash shade on Key McFarlane, who Key McFarlane was you know, the therapist who was interviewing the children, the main therapist who was interviewing the children for the McMartin case. So hey, they quick, quick, him, quick, let me interject a quick question. I have no idea. Why did they bring him in? That sounds very suspicious that he was the guy who was brought in. Because there was a man named Greg Kohler who worked for the um, NHS in Florida who used to live in Chicago who knew Greenberg. And Greenberg set himself up as a lead expert in trying to determine, you know, child abuse. And he, he had this you know, organization called Child Abuse Unit for Studies He's out of the University of Illinois. I guess you know where I'm going and I'm trying to bring the audience along. What we've come to understand is a lot of these groups that routinely testify in defense of these pedophiles in these trials are kind of a well-organized yes. network of the false memory syndrome, yes. phony baloney shit connected with NAMBLA. And this guy sounds like kind of the same thing. And the fact yes. that he's kind of handpicked to come in and give testimony contradict, you know, to, to put the facts in a certain way. H have you done any investigation into 
who might have been behind positioning him in that way? Other than Greg Kohler, I have not been able to figure out anything else that goes higher than him. Now, Greenberg, I think he ended up charging uh, Florida Health Rehabilitative Services $168,000 for his work on the Finder's case. I mean, he was offered nine contracts for his work on the Finder's case to improve Florida's response and training to handle child sexual abuse after the case. And Greenberg even mentions through some of the news articles that he does think the children were neglected unlike McMartin, where he didn't think nothing happened. But he later came to the conclusion that they were not sexually abused. And so we, the only evidence that we have of sexual abuse is the examinations by Dr. Moore, who I tried to track down, but he's been deceased for five years. I and mean, I'm still trying to track down Jane uh, Patilla of the Florida Health Rehabilitative Services to see if I can get her side. But he mentioned that it was, and this is preliminary re review. This isn't, you know, this isn't, I wish we had something more substantiated than just plenary review that I haven't, you know, there's more than what's in the Tallahassee Police Department documents. And Max Livingstone lacked anal sphincter control consistent with previous, previous sodomy. And Jordan Areco's right hymen was absent and a large vaginal orifice, which is consistent with digital penetration. That was never followed up. So right. other, than them mean, eventually, other than eventually saying that, that nothing happened. Both the Tallahassee Police Department and the news media and Dr. Nyman Greenberg. So, okay, so, so here's the really interesting part of this story. And that's a misstatement because the whole story is interesting. But let's skip ahead a little bit because the Tallahassee Police are still investigating this. And then they're called off it, said, hey, maybe you don't want to look there. And then let's lead back to, uh, as quickly as we can, Martinez, because I think that provides overwhelming evidence that these kids were being sexually molested, abused, tortured, all the rest of it. So tie those strings together. So as far as the Tallahassee Police Department is concerned, Skip Clements gave me in his interview that the FBI uh, in, in Jacksonville told the Tallahassee, in the FBI in ja Tallahassee too, told the, the Tallahassee Police Department to, to wrap up their case. Rick Huffman, on the other hand, just says the case was done that they, they, they had reunited the children with their parents and it was up to the courts to decide whether or not anything had occurred when the children should be released back to their parents. I want to talk to Scott Hunt of the Tallahassee Police Department, who was very vocal at the time. He was the organizer of the press about what was going on, that the children were molested and that it was satanic ritual abuse, but he will not talk to anyone. So hopefully one day, that if Scott Hunt ever listens to this interview, I, I hope that he does reach out to me or reaches out to Derek Rose or just reaches out to someone. So that is the way it is fr framed was that it's, you know, it just was a natural course of investigation. It was wrapped up and it was put off to the courts. Okay, so, so just this is what I heard. And I guess I'm picking through these little bits that I remember. I heard there's people in the Tallahassee police that are really pissed off. And they're like, what the hell is going on? What do you mean wrap up our investigation? That's what Clement said. And I would have to agree with him because the Tallahassee Police Department documents are not redacted. <laughs> I mean, the FBI released the Tallahassee Police Department doc documents and they redacted them. And you're supposed to redact certain information in most documents. Those documents are not redacted at all. What I hear you saying is they are making a statement in not redacting those documents. They're saying, we're not playing ball here and hiding this crime. That's what I hear you saying. Uh, I would have to say yes. I have no firm evidence on that. I would just have to say with what I know. But yeah, because most of the time you're supposed to redact certain information, vi victims' names sometimes, or um, especially if they're children, you're supposed to redact their names. No redactions were performed. Even when I got the Stuart Florida Police Department documents on James Tower, and I've seen many, many, many different types of documents ranging from law enforcement to FBI to CIA, you re you're, you're supposed to redact certain things. Tallahassee Police, and I'm grateful they didn't redact anything. Nothing's redacted in a Tallahassee Police Department documents. It's, it's just the documents. And we have further evidence, as the story goes, that would corroborate and seem to be consistent with this idea that they were pulled off of a case that they didn't think they should be pulled off of. And that's what gets us to Martinez. When the same thing happens to him, so who is Ramon J. Martinez and how does he fit into this story? So Ramon J. Martinez is, was an exemplary customs officer who worked for the child pornography uh, division. 
headed by John Sullivan. And so what, uh, what, he, year, what basic time frame is this? Late 80s. So it's 1980s. He's working for the customs office. What is the customs office doing investigating child pornography? At one time they did, they don't anymore. That was ended after the finders. And they tried to get another bill passed uh, by uh, Tom Lewis, Representative Tom Lewis in Florida to reinstate the child pornography unit. Um, See, but not. John, whenever I ask you a basic question, you jump three steps ahead. You're in customs. Customs is responsible for stuff that comes into the trafficking, country. Keeping, trafficking, keeping trafficking. Keeping bad stuff out and only letting good stuff in. So it isn't too much of an extension of those responsibilities to think that they would be interested in children who are not coming in and pornography yeah. that violates yes. our laws. If we have child pornography done by somebody overseas, that is not supposed to come in. So that might be under the purview of of customs. It was in the 1980s. So Martinez was responsible for looking into this. And what does he stumble across in Washington, D.C.? So when the Tallahassee information is going on, they contact the Washington Metropolitan Police Department once they find out that the finders are involved up there in Washington. So the Washington Metropolitan Police Department contacts the FBI, they contact the customs agency. So Ramon J. Martinez goes to investigate the finders warehouse and the finders apartments buildings on w street and so during his investigation which i later corroborated i'm the first person that i know of to get his partner bob harold on the record with what he found and bob harold okay so we've had ramon j martinez's report of investigation it's been on the internet since the back the days of usenet back in the 90s. Big picture, what does that report say? And then tell me about his, what his partner said. The only reason why I want to get to that is because I'm going to disclose something here that is not previously known. It's very important. Bob Harrell's report of investigation used to be on Usenet too. It's completely scrubbed off the face of the internet and does not exist. I cannot find it. Bob Harrell tried to find it. He can't find it. He doesn't have a copy of it. It does not exist. So they set up the narrative of what I'm about to tell you about Ramon J. Martinez, that he was a lone nutter that he did this to advance his position in customs and that he made it all up and try to bury any corroborating evidence that, that to his report of what he found. And that is complete and utter bull crap. Okay. Well, it, it's, again, we're going to get back to that other thing. It's bull crap because the Tallahassee police in 1987 arrested these guys in the park and there were all these kids that were severely mistreated and the kids tied back to Washington, D.C. I mean, there's direct that. That's why the Tallahassee police was even able to tell Martinez. And as you point out, Washington, D.C. police say, oh, yeah, that place, we investigated that years ago. And we've been investigating it ever, you know, for the past couple of years because of reports that have called in and stuff like that. It's nothing new. So, so mean, again, that, that, that false narrative, I mean, we can spend some time on it, like you're saying, to let people know that it's a false narrative, but we don't have to overemphasize it because it's just freaking ridiculous given everything we know. So now what does Martinez's report actually say, because we have reason to believe that that's more truthful than the false narrative. And how does, you know, Bob Harold, who you talk to directly, what do those reports collectively let us know? So first they raid the W Street apartments and in there they find finders member Stuart Miles Silverstone in a room that contained many computers, printers, and contained numerous documents. Now, when I talked to Harold, he told me that a majority of the computer equipment was taken out that before they had gotten there. Someone had tipped them off before they had raided the apartments and the warehouse. We'll talk about the warehouse rate later. And the computers that were in the warehouse where they had equipment in there too as well was completely gone. Okay. So, and where else did they raid? They, the, the finder's warehouse in Washington, D.C. They raided both places. So they found documents supposedly containing instructions on obtaining children for unknown purposes. They found telex messages with MCI account numbers. They found one telex order to purchase of children, of two children in Hong Kong to be arranged from a contact in the Chinese embassy in Hong Kong. They found a Chinese national, Jing Sing Wong, who was an anatomy student at, at Georgetown University who was staying there too also. And of course, 
uh, Mary, who was Jordan Rico to the Tallahassee Police Department, she claims that, you know, there were a lot of Chinese people that were around the apartments and they actually taught her to count the 10 in Chinese. So this and, does and seem don't to be- they also find that that's fantastic in, information. It's horrible information, but I'm glad that you share all that. Don't they also find information on like kind of instruction manuals and how to groom and part of what pornographers and child molesters would would have other consistent information with that they find books on mind control and they find books on papers about the impregnation of the women in the finders group operation because as horrific as this is people should know that among some of these groups that commit these horrible crimes against children they're done at a very young age so newborns infants you know it's just prime property to this kind of evil group. And, and they also found a summary of events of Tallahassee that was being communicated by the finders operation from the, because there's two vans. There was a group of finders members who were not caught, separate from Ammerman and Hollowell, that went back to D.C. afterwards. So they were sending information from a second TRS-80 computer that was found outside of the University of Florida. Bingo. So we have a direct connection between the Tallahassee case. And again, it's like, that's what pisses me off about the false narrative stuff. Why do we even have to talk that much about it? It's, but, the it's just, but another interesting thing that I want to get out is there was a series of instruction where also found how to continue moving children to avoid police detection. Well, why? What children? What children other than the six children were they, you know, the, those children were put into protective custody. And so you have a detailed summary of events of what happened in Tallahassee. Why would you get orders about uh, moving children to avoid police detection after that? So we have an incredibly creepy evil in the, in the way that, that anyone would account for it. And we'll talk about extended consciousness. Maybe we'll even talk about Christianity and Satanism and all that stuff. But this is evil, right? So this is evil. Yes. Anyone would say, anyone says this is evil. These are defenseless human beings at such a tender age. They are being robbed of their innocence. Their lives are destroyed. That's not innocence. Their entire lives are, are destroyed. Their psyche is destroyed. And then yes. they're adding on they're adding on to it, mind control and all this other horrible, horrible, horrific stuff. How does that connect to our United States government? Because it does directly, and you have proof of it, and we need to get that proof out there and so people understand. Well, I do want to say about the warehouse real quick that they they did find a doctrination center, they found video equipment, they found jars of urine and feces in the residential area. So the warehouse, you know, like I when I talked about the information with uh, Harold, he mentioned that they had computer equipment there that they were tipped off beforehand the night before that they had Chinese witnesses who owned a warehouse next to the finder's warehouse that they were loading equipment in boxes and boxes into vans the night before the raid occurred. So someone tipped them off. Right, which is important to know, but we have enough information there to sink them a million times over and put them way, way down where they need to go. So imagine again, this is a law enforcement investigation. Martinez and Harold are there with the rest of their investigators. It's a raid. We've seen them on TV. We know this is what this is like. But this raid only goes so far because, again, they get the tap on the shoulder, right? Well, the information disappears when Martinez and Harold go to review the information, you know, the telexes, the documents that they had found when they go to look at the evidence, it's gone. It's miraculously disappeared. It cannot be found. And then Martinez meets with a source off the record that, you know, pretty much tells them that's it. Nothing that can be done. No, you know, further investigation is going to happen and uh, nothing happens of it. How do they understand this is linked to the CIA and the FBI? In the new uh, documents that were released by the FBI vault, the CIA was investigating the finders w well within the 1960s. Marion Petty's wife, Isabel Petty, worked for the Central Intelligence Agency as a secretary. He put her in there to gain information from the CIA. Uh, the FBI was investigating the finders as early as the late 1960s, the early 1970s as well. Toby Terrell worked for a company called Future Enterprises, where Future Enterprises is a computer training company. Who's Toby Terrell? He was very high up within the finder's operation. His name is Robert Gardner Terrell, and he was Marion Petty's second in command. 
what other evidence do we have the finders operation slash cult had connections and was part of this brownstone operation that was ongoing inside of both the FBI and the CIA? Because as we established early on, there is an irresistible desire for these intelligence organizations to use this exploitation of children, regardless of who's doing it. In this case, this horrific finders group they still want the kids so that they can entrap people and blackmail them. So how do we establish that that connection really did happen? Because of the equipment that was found at the warehouse, as well as them also taking supposedly video cassettes and pictures out of the warehouse that contained child pornography that uh, Martinez and Harold never were able to look at again. However, there's many news reports that those pictures were carried around in plastic bags as evidence, as well as in Toby Terrell's book, The Game Caller. And I have not talked to Athena Veronius yet, former FBI agent, but I will talk with her. He says that she told him that, you know, because he was, you know, she shows up and she, well, she calls him at Future Enterprises office this morning to talk to him. And he goes, okay, so he, because he's hiding out there at first. So he meets her down there. And so they talk. And so she pretty much tells him that, don't worry, be kept under wraps. That's not her exact quote that's used in the book, but it's, it's to that. And so, you know, when Athena Veronius, when, all, when she goes to see the evidence that Ramon Martinez had found, and she goes to investigate the warehouse and the apartment buildings afterwards, she says she finds nothing and makes out that Martinez is a liar. So they were burying, the FBI was burying it from the get-go. So that's circumstantial evidence. It's good. What other evidence do we have linking Martinez to CIA or FBI programs? What do you mean? I mean, other than Clements giving the testimony that, you know, the uh, customs agents were told by the intelligence operations to stand down Exactly. on the second day of their investigation of the, uh, of the warehouse and apartment. If I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, because you know, you're the principal investigator, I just think you have an overflow of information in your head. They're told directly that this is a CIA operation, don't go there. Yes, they're told directly this CIA operation in the stand down, yes. Who is told? When are they told? How do the we know that? The customs agents were told this by testimony of Henry Clements, who was an investigator of both Glendale and the Finders and who Ramon J. Martinez had mentioned that he respected Clements and his whistleblower complaint to give you know, Clements credibility. He was told through his investigation that, that the customs agents were told that this was a CIA operation were told to stand down. Just like the reports that were the Metropolitan Police Department reports that were secret, that were you know, declassified, that Detective John Stitcher and Jim Bradley, Jim Bradley he mentions that there are connections to the Central Intelligence Agency in his report but however, that they were tangentially and that they were using the finders to disseminate inaccurate information. And that was the only involvement that the CIA had with the finders that they would give them inaccurate information to disseminate to, to people, kind of like disinformation campaign. And John Stitcher, who we don't have his full report, but I do have his chronology from the Metropolitan Police Department that was unredacted that Henry Clements gave to me. And I'm the only person with that copy that I know of that states that Marion Petty had passports to North Korea, USSR, and Vietnam uh, through the 1950s throughout the 1980s, which would have been almost impossible to have said passports or to return back to United States soil after visiting those places without having some sort of higher end connection to an intelligence agency, which is listed in that chronology. John, you keep bringing up these connections to uh, communist foreign powers, China, North Korea, and stuff like that. Why do you think that's important? How do you think that fits into this story? I don't think you're trying to uh, disparage Chinese people per se. No, 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 no. I, I'm just saying that's where that, that that's just what the evidence shows. In that, but uh, what a lot are your these... suspicions in terms of how these links? work well how is the game i mean uh, the people as they listen to this they're they're like you are they're saying give me the evidence give it the evidence but then they're switching to the other side and goes what's the big picture why why north korea why these other things and it's because there's this a, a world child trafficking usually through a lot of those i yeah, mean child, it's child tra trafficking it's worldwide drug trafficking arms partnering, trafficking partnering with organizations governments 
uh, intelligence organizations that have greater freedom and control to do whatever the heck they want to people. Yes. And, you know, you become allies in, in evil deeds. Yeah, I mean, very much so. So they, you know, to, to, to facilitate all this, it can't just happen within the United States in and of itself. You have to work with foreign intelligence agencies and foreign governments. Uh, you don't to, have to, but it's a great cover, right? I'm, well, yeah, I yeah. It, I move it to China and now it's buried. You can't get to it. It's just like if I move it outside of the government into some private contractor, DynCorp or whatever, now it's harder for you to get at it. Or Mossad connections to Jeffrey Epstein, you know. It, it makes talk it, about that. So, so are there any parallels between the are obviously between finders and Jeffrey Epstein and what we see and the suspicion that we have that this is a brownstoning operation intelligence clearly there's all the links to Mossad there but there's also links to the CIA with the Epstein case right Yes, very much so. So, I mean, with Robert Maxwell and Guzay Maxwell, Robert Maxwell being uh, uh, termed, you know, the, the Israeli uh, super spy for the Mossad. I mean, that, that, that with every brownstone operation, whether it's Franklin or Epstein or, or the Finders, you have connections to foreign intelligence agencies and connections to heads of state of, of foreign governments or even the governments of your own country. And I think, you know, they, they cooperate with one another exactly like you said a minute ago, Alex, is, is to kind of, you know, I can only investigate really so much what happens in the United States. I can't really look into the Mossad connections uh, very easily and freedom of information requests and at all over there in Israel to try to get any information of certain connections that maybe of or China. You know, how, how am I going to petition the Chinese government to release any information about the finders over there or any investigations of finders occurred by the Chinese government or Russia? I mean, it's, it's hard enough to get information from my own government, <laughs> let, let alone foreign governments. So you're writing this book on the finders cult slash operation. Do you have a working title at this point? No, I do not. Where do you think this book is going to take you? What is the angle on the book? What are you trying to, at the end of the day, what are you trying to reveal? The biggest thing that I'm trying to do with this book is, is a way to clear Ramon J. Martinez and that he has been slandered by multiple people within the media. There's a guy trying to make a documentary named Tyler Rabbit who interviewed many Finders members and who interviewed Ramon J. Martinez and everything. And he's trying to push the narrative that there's nothing to see here, that there were no intelligence connections or anything like that. That The, the, the basic narrative that the Finders were just a progressive cult. And so, you know, Ramon J. Martinez, he lost everything. You know, the Customs Department railroaded him. When you read the whistleblower complaint, I mean, they shut him down. They destroyed his career. So this book, my main objective with this book, other than to get down to the bottom of what really happened, is to clear Ramon J. Martinez's name the best of my ability. Because, you know, people still to this day, they throw the finders out because they're like, oh, Ramon J. Martinez, he's just a right wing militia nutter. And, you know, and, and that's one of the biggest problems that we have of all this, of, of trying to show a body of evidence that this, that this occurred. You know, as I mentioned very early on, you have kind of sent me on this journey. But, you know, when you're interviewing Annika Lucas, who I just shared with you, who was sold into sex slavery by her mother at six years old. And one of the things I thought was interesting, because I want to return to the satanic part of the ritual abuse. So people have heard my interview with Annika. And she says how she was, you know, just, oh, it's, it's horrific, the, the, the rape over and over and over again. But event, eventually they were going to kill her. And then I'm asking her, and I said, well, some people like Russ Dizdar, who I talked to also, who has worked with hundreds of victims of satanic ritual abuse. So he has people that come and say, it was satanic. They were wearing robes. They were drawing these inverted pentagrams in blood and you know all this other this other symbology and they were repeating these satanic phrases and he has as an investigator who's worked with the police he, he says this is the evidence you can make with it what you will but this is what these people are reporting so the interesting thing for me is i'm talking to annika and annika you can Watch her, you know, 500,000 viewed YouTube when she talks about this horror of child sex trafficking that she went through, but the terms are even softened. It's child sex trafficking. It's not repeatedly being raped and then being, yeah. being 
on the block to be murdered and is spared. But here's the point I was leading up to. I said, well, what about the satanic part? Because I just talked to Russ and he's big on the satanic. She goes, oh yeah, it was satanic ritual abuse. And I was like blown away, like my stomach drops. Because here's somebody and she presents as this kind of European and she doesn't like to throw that out there. But when she's pushed, she says, of course, yeah, it's satanic. So I think we need to process that in a way that gets us to that next level. Because you're a Christian, and yes. I don't respect anyone's religious beliefs. I'm sorry, I don't respect your religious beliefs. I don't respect anyone's religious beliefs, because we're not supposed to. We're just supposed to follow the data. We're not supposed to have, you don't need me to be kind to you or not poke at you because you have certain beliefs. You put your beliefs out there and you have to back them up. And that's what everybody does. But I want to get to that next. You are going to be attacked. And you know this, and I'm sure you already are, as a crazy Christian who is trying to jam everything back into a Christian narrative. And I want to talk. So that's one of the reasons I want to talk about this and talk about you know, we've just had a two hour discussion and you didn't bring up Christianity at all. You just said this document followed by this document, followed by this police report, followed by this investigator who I talked to who said this. So that's not been your agenda. But now from us as a skeptico guy, I want to know why the hell do you want to jam this back into a Christian narrative. Why do you think it, it has to be? One of the things that really kind of pissed me off, John, is in the email you sent me, you kind of said, yeah, as long as it all leads back to Christianity. Why? Why does this evil have to lead back to this narrow, dogmatic little book that is just one description of what this universal evil that's been reported by every culture throughout time, whether Christian or not, why do we need to jam it back into the Christian narrative? You have atheist reporters and investigative journalists. For example, George from cabdef.org wrote uh, Dave McGowan, who reported satanic ritual abuse. People who are either agnostic or don't believe in God or religion, period. They definitely don't believe in Christianity, like myself. They came to the same conclusion that they'll lead to participating in satanic ritual abuse. Satan primarily being the adversary in the Old Testament and the adversary in the New Testament. So my question to you is, to throw it back, is yes, I might frame it as such because of my own personal faith and my own personal beliefs as being satanic ritual abuse. And I'd ask you, well, why don't you frame it as, why do you use the term satanic when, why wouldn't you just use ritual abuse? Why wouldn't you just use religious ritual abuse? Those people look at it objectively who are not Christian and see it as such with the inverted pentagrams, the references to Satan that the world elite use. So if they look at it as that, then, I mean, I get you. They're That's objective as they are, as objective as they are, because they're not looking at it through my lens. Now, granted, do I do my best to look at it objectively outside of my faith? Yes. Do I believe ultimately that this all leads to Christianity to some degree, or Judaism, as far as the beliefs in Satan, the beliefs of good and evil God versus Satan. Yeah, I do. But someone like Dave McGowan, that's not the case. Someone like George from CavDav.org, that's not the case. Now, Russ Dizdar, yes, he's a Christian, so he's going to look at it through that lens. But these other people who are not are also, because the elites practice it in such that regard, look at it and through that lens too as well. So again, what do you have to say? Thank you. Thank you for teeing up an excellent question uh, in this vast unplowed field that exists out there between atheism and Christianity or some other dogmatic religious belief. John, you, you, you know, I have a ton of respect, like I've already said, for the work that you've done. 
here's where I'm coming at it from. And you know this from having listened to some of the Skeptico episodes. Yes, of course. I have no doubt that Christ consciousness is real. I don't know what Christ consciousness is, but I accept the scientific data that leads us to the conclusion that consciousness does exist. It's real. We are not biologic robots in a meaningless universe. And the other data that you just get to scientifically, which is that near-death experience is real, right? So we have the best cardiologist in the world and resuscitation experts and radiation oncologists, 200 peer-reviewed journals, and they're all telling us the same thing, that consciousness seems to survive bodily death in a way that completely blows our understanding of this brain-based consciousness apart. That then leads us to taking seriously the accounts of the near-death experience. Yes. Now, many of those accounts, as you know, point to the reality of a Christian experience. But if you take the full body of that knowledge, it points to that not being an exclusively true club. What seems to emerge, and this isn't a huge leap, but it's just where the data has taken me, is that we are co-creators of reality, that there is this greater good, there is this light that we can access, and we are co-creators of it. So, of course, Christianity and in particular, Christ consciousness, which I maintain is all any Christian can ever talk about because the books are hopeless. No uh, intelligently thinking Christian really relies on literal scripture. It just doesn't make sense. Invariably, what they say and what I respect is I have a personal relationship with Jesus, which means I have a personal relationship with Christ consciousness. Great. I have up on the screen multiple people who I've interviewed. Well, let me interject. I used to have your train of thought. I used to be Gnostic in my beliefs. Christ consciousness blends into Gnosticism no, in that regard. No, not necessarily. But game, I, I, understand, I, understand, I understand that. I have no problem with you questioning mine. I have no issue with that whatsoever. Great. So, you know, there's no protected belief system here. And in the court of public opinion, no. what you believe, if you're a flat earther, that matters. That matters to your credibility. And so what, what matters to me is what you just said. You, you kind of mischaracterized my, I, I told you that my belief in extended consciousness, and again, I got 400 shows that document yeah. my long progression into understanding, one, that consciousness exists and that the atheistic, materialistic uh, meme that we're, I think is, is purposely perpetrated in order to prevent us, provide a blockage for us really accessing extended consciousness and uh, the broader understanding of that. But then you never really responded to my observation that there is no reason to limit those extended consciousness realms to Christian only. And as a matter of fact, you know, all the near-death experience accounts, they are not Gnostic in the way that you're talking about. They just aren't. You're mischaracterizing them. But you're but framing it as Christ consciousness, and that is Gnosticism. You, that's your understanding of, of my word, Christ consciousness. You can define it as Gnostic. So you're just, defining it as, you're just defining it as human consciousness. No, I'm saying... Look, here's what, I'm, here's what I was trying to that say. That we have a soul, that we have a spirit, that there is an afterlife of some sort, right? Or am I no. or mistaken? Mistaken. Okay. What I'm okay. saying is that I don't understand consciousness. I do understand from the data that it's obvious that we have an awareness of what we are, and that I would call consciousness. And I'm also persuaded by the data that that awareness extends beyond our bodily death. That realm, uh, and extends beyond our body, that realm of extension I call extended consciousness. Now, in that extended consciousness realm, it's people are consistently reporting that they are encountering all kinds of spiritual beings. Some of them appear to be benevolent, guardian angels, 
relatives that are seem to be cooperating and helping people in meaningful ways in their life and they come back and their life is transformed or their life is healed. So we have other ways that as just normal common sense people, we would say, gee, that seems like the benevolent cooperation of a spirit in an extended realm without jamming that into some fricking Christian or Muslim or Buddhist thing. That just seems to be happening. My use of the term Christ consciousness is derived from the fact that people say in that extended realm, they have reported meeting of spiritual being that they understand at that time to be Jesus Christ of the Christian tradition of the Bible. So that is the way I'm using Christ consciousness for those specific people that that is their report. I don't know what to make of their report. So then I'm leaping to the next level and saying, it doesn't take a genius to say, there seems to be good and bad in this extended consciousness realm. We yeah. seem to be co-creators of this extended consciousness realm. We can create the good. We can look to the light. We can ascend and do good things with our spirit. Or it seems to be the truth, the reality that we just talked about, that we can connect and identify with this need for satisfying this material uh, existence here, this wanting of things, of power, of sex, of money, of control, and this fear of death, this fear of annihilation of this ego, little mini me that I've created, that I don't, that, that, that seems to me so much broader than this narrowly little defined one religion kind of thing. It one assumes the other. I don't know why we want to try and jam it back in the other, but again, I, I don't want to get distracted. That is just my read of the data, John. I don't, I don't know how one pulls that data apart any differently. I don't get it. Okay, let me ask you a question then. Explain to me satanic ritual abuse without using the Christian lens then of, of people saying that inverted pentagrams of you are used, Satanism is involved, that they're invoking demons. If it's not that, then, you know, if it's not that, then I want to know how you see it. Great. Because there are many people who are giving that narrative. Let me give an attempt at it. And the, the last thing I want to do is sound like I know anything here, because I don't. But this is a topic that I am going to dive into further and further, because, again, to me, it's the unplowed field in this whole spirituality extended consciousness. I pulled up on the screen, if you can ignore Joe Atwell, because I know you hate him. I want to point you I to- don't, Okay, I don't hate him as a person. I just dislike a lot <laughs> okay. of his reasoning. Those Fair are enough. two separate Fair things. Enough. Whatever. I'm going to draw your attention to the book by Richard Smoley, who was on the show, How God Became God. One of the things that I think is interesting about this Oxford trained theologian or, or just researcher really, who's just written all these terrific books and is a very scholarly guy, is he goes back and he traces the kind of very early pre-Torah Judaic documents. And what he finds is no Satan. So he finds all the stories that wind up in the Torah, in the Old Testament with Satan in him, but he finds him with no Satan. Now, my he, now, now, let me ask you a question about that. Does he bring up Job possibly being written first and how Satan is shown there as to be the adversary, but as an agent of God to, to challenge Job? Because I've not listened to an interview or read his book, so I don't know, but I would assume that is one of the conclusions that he makes. You know, I, I can't tell you that off the top of my head, but I hope to have him back on and I will ask him that exact question. But that doesn't directly answer your question. The direct answer for me in your question is, of course, Satan is real because we are co-creators of that reality, can shape themselves into whatever our mind shapes them. 
this idea is repeated over and over in a lot of great spiritual traditions and in a lot of esoteric traditions. And it just seems to be a reality of the universe. We are co-creators. So if your thought form goes to Satan, yes, you will find connection. And uh, uh, the way I always put it is as below, so above. I mean, can you find creepy people who uh, want to do horribly uh, pathetic, psychopathic things? Can you find them in this world? You certainly can. Like Ted Bundy, and I, I know you've heard the story, and I heard it on Ed Opperman. I don't want to throw Ed Opperman under the bus. He does a lot of really great stuff. But the story I love about Ted Bundy is Ted Bundy isn't into satanic shit. He's into doing the most evil. He's connected with some evil spiritual force that is, you know, align with him as he's done these evil deeds. But is he open to satanic stuff when he encounters another guy along his journey? And I forget the guy's name. And he says, oh, yeah, man, I'll tell you how to double down on the power that you're tapping into. Here it is. Do this ritual. Do this. And Ted Bundy is like, why the hell not? I mean, I'm already, my soul, if you will, is already at that level. Why wouldn't I be open to that? I think that ties back to what you're talking about. The, you know, you go to the party with King, you go to the party with Epstein, you know, you're already sunk your battleship, man. So I don't know. That's my, that's my understanding of, yes, there's a reality to it. And you are a co-creator of that reality of uh, the satanic stuff. So let me ask you a question, Alex. Do you believe in a higher power, in God, or in a creator? I'm, I'm just curious. Well, I mean, take what I just said. Well, not, not outside of ourselves, do you believe in a divine being that created? See, that's the problem with the Christian thing. No, no, that, that, no, that, no, that, that's not... I, who am I to presuppose that I understand the mind of God? I no, I'm do. saying, is there a creator separate from yours? That's not just from the Christian lens. That is from many different religions. And, and I guess that's my point, John. I don't mean to be combative because you're fantastic, buddy, and you got to keep doing what you're doing. I think that overreaches my knowledge. Like one of the things I take stock in is the fact that so many people who reach this extended consciousness realm, have this download of information, have this all knowing, but then they're not able to maintain it. I don't think in my, you know, in my physical body, I'm able to understand the mind of God in enough to understand what that means in terms of God. What I do think, one of my working things, is that the secret to the ascent is to always look up. And that answers the question for me. I need to ascend. My soul needs to ascend. I need to do good things, have good thoughts. I need to emanate the love that I see coming through these people that are transformed by these experiences. That's where I need to be. And that's really simple. It's just not that complicated. I don't need to understand God. I just need to be more like these people that are, are emanating all that stuff that seems to be God-like. And I need to not do the stuff that all these people do that seem to be emanating this satanic devil bad stuff. It ain't that freaking complicated. I can't, I can't say that you can't do good not, you know, being a Christian, like an atheist cannot, I'm not saying you're an atheist, but just using that as an example, cannot do good works. I mean, it happens, but, you know, the only, the only difference between me and you in that belief is, is it's, it's faith versus, versus works, faith in God versus, you know, works as far as, as uh, you know, as far as your soul going to the afterlife. Why would you want to have faith? Why not have doubt? Doubt is the most spiritual thing. Faith is decided. I just, you know, when I just spoke recently with- uh, That's not woman. necessarily true. Christians I just spoke with this woman uh, who's in the Ramtha cult, you know, and I kind of told her, Skeptico, inquiry to perpetuate doubt. And she goes, oh no, I don't have any doubt. I know, I know. 
because Knight, I'm the in head, the cult. Hold on. Did you talk to J, J, Jay-Z Knight, the head of the Randall School of Enlightenment, or someone that was in? A disciple. Let's talk about that off of this. <laughs> take, take this part off. <laughs> I mean, me saying that, but let's talk about, let's talk about that off air sometime. Oh, I'm, I'm I don't know what we talk about off air. It's a cult. And no, like, I mean, me and you, let's talk about it off air sometimes. Their connections to Push and Q and, you know, and them LARPing this stuff since the 1990s and everything and then pushing Trump. And we'll talk about off, that off air. Happy to. But the, 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 the bottom line to me is Christianity. But you, you know, here's the, I guess, the hard, the hard edge question related to this is that, and I think a lot of people would see it this way, so I'm not like uniquely pushing this, but what's been revealed so far, particularly like the Catholic church thing, or this interview I did with Kevin Annette, former minister for the Church of Canada, all these horrible crimes, evil church against, I mean, the pedo pope, none of that stuff, from the optics from the high level would lead people to your understanding of Christianity. How, how you try and rescue Christianity from that mess, it fits much better with- That's not Christianity though. Oh, it's just, right. It, it's, oh just, right. It, it's, it's the same as me saying, you know, was your child ever at a daycare or a public school? Or a school no, period, you know. No, and it, it's really not because the Catholic Church is the church, right? Before uh, a few years ago, there wasn't even any other Christian church other than the Catholic Church. But it, from so, its very inception, it wasn't like that, though. That's the corruption of the of the the the, 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 the fruit of the tree. No one's arguing here now that you're not going to have bad faith actors within any religion. I mean, you could say the same thing about Islam. You could say the thing. Heck, what about when I did my series? tracking the abuse throughout all religions and the abuse that occurred in Buddhist temples. Buddhism's farthest, exactly. from, the, farthest from that, but it's but, still But John, happens, that, though. Supports, that supports what I'm saying. It doesn't support what you're saying. For the but it happens, who, in, it happens outside of religion too as exactly. well, though. Exactly. That's happens. my point. But that's my point. Again, this is what Christians don't get because they're so, it's all apologetics. It's all bringing it back and jamming it back. I'm not saying Christian. that there haven't been evil things that have happened with but the again, Christian church. You're not, you're not hearing my point. I'm probably not hearing your okay. point. But here's my point is that just optics, just looking at it from the big picture, like I was talking about in the narrative with, uh, you know, why do we have to explore these silly narratives that the, the guy who's going to defend the, the finder's cult and saying, oh, yeah, well, it's, we're teaching this three-year-old animal husbandry, and that's why we dipped their hands in the blood and, you know, made them do it. You know, it's like, that's a crazy story. So uh, I, I, it's equally crazy to me to say, oh, yeah, well, all these Christian groups and the largest Christian uh, sect of the cult in, in history, the Catholics seem to be systemically, institutionally involved with uh, sex crimes against children, but uh, that doesn't matter. There's a truer Christianity behind it. Kevin Annette comes on and says, oh yeah, it's not just the Catholics in Canada here, it's the Church of Canada and I have proof of it. Oh, but that doesn't shed, uh, that doesn't reflect poorly on Christianity. You know, Jesus is still working behind all this. It doesn't, it just doesn't you, really add up. It doesn't really question, add are you, up. Are, are, are you an American citizen? Yes. What about all the crimes that the high, okay, I believe in the American people as me being an American citizen. I believe in the ideals of the American people, of what the American people stand for, you know, but when you look at America as a whole, the founding fathers, majority of them were Masons, majority of them practiced you know, a lot of things that we would find just as abhorrent today as, as, you know, our elites do now. Okay. So you're telling me, well, yeah, the high, you know, the high, the Christian, you know, belief that you have the Pope, you have, you know, the, the, the crimes of the Southern Baptist church to the CMP, like judge Paul Pressler and stuff like that. You have all these scandals within Christianity. Therefore you, you know, if there's also good fruits, for example, what about the work that I have done as a Christian or my, my best friend's mother down the street, who's a Catholic, who has no idea what happens at the top of the Catholic church, but she spends, you know, her weekends, you know, volunteering and, and being a good person and stuff like that and everything. I'm it's just saying all being that American fits citizens. better into my model than it, it does into your model. No, it doesn't because you, you're an American citizen. I'm an American citizen. We know that the American government is 
done horrific crimes, horrific crimes, but yet we still choose to be citizens of this country in the hope that, you know, one day that the good that the American public have done will outweigh the bad of what the government has done. Yes, there are corruption within God's church. There's no denying that. Just like there is corruption within any religion. So, I mean, that's not the tenets of Christianity. Just like, you know, molestation in Buddhist temples aren't the tenets of Buddhism. So, I'm or, or, no, or the, or the I'm, ritual abuse that happens at the mikvah of baths. I mean, we again, take the Old I, Testament. I, I, that's throw, not what's taught by the, the Ten Commandments. The Buddhist, you can throw stones at the I'm not. I just <laughs> talked about no, no, Judaism. I'm right there. I'm right there with you. How about the fact that most, Briti most Buddhist cults have not, uh, and sects have not been open to the or, uh, ordaining women? I mean, how do you make any sense out of that? It doesn't make any sense. Again, it, we got to wrap things up because you got to go. Do. You've been so generous with all your time here, but it, it does not, to me, just take a step back. It is not a, a, a supportive of your exclusively Christian only. Jesus is orchestrating the whole thing. It's much more consistent with what I'm saying, which is this stuff isn't that hard to figure out. We have to ascend. We have to try and raise our soul to that higher consciousness that we all know from an early kid. You know the, the stuff you're supposed to do. It, you don't need Jesus. It's like my friend Kevin Annette says. But why is the world order doing their darndest to frame anybody who's a Christian like myself as someone who is just crazy, lunatic, insane if there was not some truth within the New Testament? That's a ridiculous I, question. They're, why? How is that ridiculous? Because they they're not they frame it as a, they frame it as a satanic panic. They frame it as crazy Christians. They, that's, that's what right. they frame it. That's as. That's right. But the, the the purpose for that is is more. Again, it's like all the stuff we've talked about here. It's just more. You know, why do they do uh, why do they do brown brownstoning? Because it advances their agenda. So if your agenda is to control everybody. And if you're in concert with the most evil, uh, malevolent spiritual forces, which we don't understand, which I'm saying I don't understand. You understand because they're all in your thing there. I'm saying I don't understand them, but I can understand how someone in partnership with that. I don't understand that, everything. I, I'm not I saying that I do. I can understand why someone in partnership with that would completely uh, object to, uh, to what you're saying. Because you're, you're, at the end of the day, you're doing the same thing I do. You're trying to ascend. You're trying to raise your vibration. You're trying to raise your soul. Whether you like those terms or not, that's what you're trying to I'm do. You're trying to go to heaven, yeah. yes. So they're against, they're against me as much as they're against you, just because I don't identify as a Christian. I didn't, say they were, I didn't say they were not against you in that regard as far as you trying to bring ritual satanic abuse to light. I didn't say this like Dave McGowan was an atheist and they were against him or George. Exactly. I'm not saying that at all. Exactly. I'm just saying is nationally, though, as a collective, they frame it specifically against Christianity. At least with here in the United States, and you can see it also there with Europe. Now, your argument to that could be would be because those are regional regions where Christianity exists, but there are satanic ritual abuse cases throughout the globe uh, that, that are not in Christian areas. So, you know, again, I, I, you know, you and I are not going to are not going to you know agree on this, and we we just we just won't. I and and I do say the more that you. The more that you investigate satanic ritual abuse, the more just just be on the lookout for and just see how many instances where they're trying to degrade Christianity specifically. Of course. Um, John, when is this book coming out? Again, our guest, folks, has been John Brisson. You can find him at We Read the Documents. You can find many fantastic interviews. Again, this is a guy who does the research. Uh, so many of his interviews that I've listened to have been extremely fundamentally instructive for me in understanding this. So our little foray into the Christian debate to me is completely separate than the solid research this guy is doing. Tell us more about this book, when you think, I know it's a huge project, when you think that might be out and how people can follow your investigative work. 
thank you, Alex, again for having me on Skeptico. And yeah, even though we had a, a, a agree, you know, I wouldn't even call it just just debating. I, I still, you know, appreciate you know your friendship and appreciate you looking into this and everything. And and yeah, you guys can find me on. We've read the documents on YouTube. Uh, we've read on Twitter. Hopefully this book will be out by the end of this year. I got about half of it written, about 150, 170 pages, but I'm still trying to track down some more people to interview to the case, to be able to get more information about the overall uh, finder's nexus. Some people that have not been able to fully been able to track down yet. It's, it's impossible sometimes, <laughs> even using Spokio and, and, and certain uh, websites to try to, to track down people can be quite difficult. But there are, you know, I still want to interview some of the children that were uh, put into custody down there at Tallahassee to try to get some information from the finders. Derek Bros has interviewed Robert Gardner Terrell um, and got an interview with him on there. Just, just so I want to, you know, ask them questions to try to gain more information. And, and also want to try to interview uh, former FBI agent Athena Veronius. And, you know, so I still have more inter interviews that I want to do for the book to try to get to ask questions, to try to get more information out there. Um, and hopefully it will be tentatively, I'm looking towards the end of this year for it to be out, hopefully. One of the things I love about your work, like you're going to interview Athena. I can't wait. That is not going to be a friendly interview, right? No, <laughs> no, it's and not. Most people are not brave enough to do those, you know, so, so that's very cool. I hope you, she probably won't do it, but you've she done probably won't, but I'm going to try. Yeah. Try. And you've done other ones with kind of non-friendly. So that's, that's real investigation. Yes. Thank you, Alex. You're awesome, John. Thank you much for spending all this time with us. And I'll try and put this into some form that people can maybe understand. Thank you. Take care. Take care, buddy. Bye. Thanks again to John Brisson for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview, and it's the follow-on question that we didn't get to to the end. With all this mounting evidence of satanic ritual abuse, what are we to make of Satan and his role? And in particular, what are we to make of the very narrowly defined Christian definition? Let me know your thoughts. As I mentioned at the beginning of this show, there's been somewhat of a mass exodus from Skeptico as I continue to probe the topic of evil and all its dimensions. And I get that. This is a tough road. So if you're with me, if you're still following along, if you'd like to jump in this dialogue and join me, please hop on over to the skepticoforum.com. Leave me a note. Let me know what you're thinking and let me know your answer to that question. I have a number of great shows, I think, coming up. Please stay with me for all of that. Till next time, take care and bye for now. Bye.